why did that season tail off? Was it the Ekyog injury or just off field issues? Or Big Hugo was a massive miss to us, uh, a massive miss. He got kicked in the face at Newcastle by Shearer, funnily enough. And uh, he had a problem with his eye and, and we, missed, we missed him terribly um, whilst he was out the side. Um, and it was just, I think, I mean, obviously a, a lot of it was, was down to me. Um, ultimately, the manager takes responsibility for it, but I, I wanted to improve the squad, as always. I was always looking to try and get better, try and get it better. Um, but uh, it, I think it just tailed off in many respects, a little bit down to my lack of experience as well, I think, you know, of, 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 of being in charge of a team that were pushing for a title pushing for the Premier League title um, and I think probably you know I looked at myself at the end of that season and thought maybe I, I could have done things better and and, and uh, I, I was beginning to start to get a bit bogged down with stuff off the field with uh, with the chairman you know with with the training ground issue I was trying to get our training ground upgraded I was trying to uh, take Villa into the next century, you know, this is now 1999, we're, we're coming up to 1999 and I know that we need to now sort of start move on and, and we had problems with our training and I thought it was a bit dilapidated and it needed upgrading. Arsenal had just built this new £30 million uh, training centre at London Colney and I felt that it was about time we started doing things. And I, I think I got a bit distracted with things like that when really I should have just been focusing on the team, um, working with the team. Uh, one or two players were not playing as well as they had done maybe the previous year. Um, so that was a real difficult period to deal with at the end of that season, you know, literally from Christmas onwards, um, right up until May. Uh, we didn't finish very strongly, certainly not how we started the season. And uh, we kind of were going back to how we were when I first came in, you know, which was, uh, there was a few alarm bells ringing. So I just wanted the season to finish as, as quickly as possible. Um, scrub it all clean, get back to zero points, everybody, and let's have another go next year. Did Bosnich's injury kill it a bit? Because I always remember thinking, like, if, if he'd have stayed fit, we never used to concede many goals in those days. And we had a lot of players that could, that could score goals. Because he, he was a different level. If he'd have stayed fit, we'd have, I think we'd have been right up there. Yeah, I, I, I always had this thing with Bosnich about his particular injury. He went to Man U that year, yeah? The year after, yeah. In the summer, the year yeah. after, yeah. I, I had, um, the, f the following year, I had um, a few suspicions about his injury, but at that particular time, he was, uh, he was a big miss to us. And we used to look at, um, I used to, we, we often would defend the whole end in the first half, we'd defend yeah. that. And we had young Michael Oates go in there. And I, I suddenly, we sat down one day and we looked at the goals and, and how we conceded them and where we conceded them. And we suddenly looked at it and we realised that we were conceding a lot of goals in the first half at home, at the whole end. Yeah. And Michael was, was in front of 13,500 people in that stand, in that just one stand. And, and I think it was daunting for him at times. And we just looked at it and we said, yeah, he's kept a clean sheet in the second half at the north end at the North Stand end, but in the first half, he's conceding goals. And we've been conceding goals at that end, and we kind of put it down to a little bit of maybe a lack of experience, but we certainly uh, miss Mark Bosnich when he was, uh, he, again, he, you talk about players, about Merson having a presence, and Mark Bosnich had a, had a major press, and he was another one that would take it into the dressing room at half time. If it weren't right, he would, he would voice an opinion. And, and often you, you hear it these days that you know, half-time team talks are not what they used to be because sometimes I wouldn't need to speak at half-time because there'd be three or four of the senior players all having a dig at each other and, and having a dig at the young ones as well. I mean, if you, if you put on a shirt and you went out there on that pitch, you know, you were going to get as much stick as anybody else. It didn't matter what age you were or what experience you had. When senior players wanted it done a certain way, they would voice their opinions. And, and Bosnich was, you know, he was somebody that commanded his penalty box. And he would come for a cross and he might drop it and they might score, but he'd come for the next one. And that was a great thing about Mark. It didn't bother him. He'd still come for the next. He was such a, uh, an outgoing person that he would come for the next cross and it just wouldn't, and in more, more often than not, he would, he would uh, collect it, you know. So yeah, he was a, he was a big miss. We couldn't afford to, to lose any of our players because we were still a, a relatively 
small squad with regard to senior players. Um, we didn't have the size of squads that Chelsea and, and Liverpool and Arsenal had and, and Man U. Um, we, we were very limited and, and we couldn't afford to, to lose some of our senior players. And God forbid if we lost two like we did with Hugo and, and Mark, it made a, a big dent in our team. What were your expectations going into the following season, 99-2000? Like, what were you hoping to build on from the previous year? I'd seen what we'd done the previous year and, and obviously kind of knew everything was possible. It was, uh, again, it was, it was, you know, down to players trying to put together a squad, trying to put together a team. Um, and I thought that the following season would, would still be up there amongst them, you know, in the top four or five. Uh, and as always, it's that start. Uh, media attention, if you get a start, they leave you alone. If you get a good start, they leave you alone. If you get a bad start, if you lose the first three games, suddenly all the focus is on you as a manager, whether or not you're going to keep your job. I mean, it's, it's crazy in today's world, you know, 2017, it's mental now, uh, what happens with managers, but it was much the same in those days, you know, immediately you lost two or three games, um, they suddenly start talking about whether or not you're going to stay there. So the start of the following season was, was just the same and you've got to make sure you get, get off to a good one. So uh, it was important that we got a good start and we did okay. Not quite as good as the year before, but we, we did okay. We then went on and had like a little bit of a, a sticky patch. Yeah. You ended up being a bit naughty and getting a touchline ban, so you yeah. had to go to the stands. Is it true that the players made you stay there yeah, afterwards? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely made me stay there. Uh, Ian Taylor, more than anybody. Um, he had the bottle to tell me though, you see, I think, tails. Um, yeah, we got, um, I got a ban and um, I, I'm not too sure how the results went, but they were favourable. They were better than when I'd been on the bench. So I got banished to the stand and went up in the stand and uh, obviously the lads went out and, and played well and, and my ban finished and I can remember before the game, I knew full well I was going to go upstairs again, keep out of the way. But I suggested to the lads, would you like me to come back on the bench? And Ian Taylor actually said, gaff, go upstairs. So I said, okay. So I did. Um, yeah, he said, You'll be, you're better off upstairs, boss. You can see more up there, boss. He used to say, <laughs> started to be nice to me. But um, no, I went upstairs and just kept out of the way and, and, and the results sort of continued to go well. I remember, actually, I'll tell you, tell you a story. I got banned, so at Villa Park, I'm gonna have to sit upstairs in the director's box. So they put in a phone line for me. I'm gonna sit on the back row of the director's box near the door. So I could, if I need to run down to the bench, I can. But they put a phone for me. Now from the director's box in those days to the dugout, I had to go all the way downstairs. This is the, uh, the, old, the old stand, of course. I had to go all the way downstairs, all along to the dressing room, down whatever it is, 50 or 60 steps of the tunnel onto the pitch and then another sort of 40 meters along the side of the pitch to get to the dugout. You know, that's like, from, even for me, that's like 90 seconds. So we said, let's put a phone in. So on the Thursday afternoon or something, stadium manager, Tony Diffley says, I've got your phone, I've fitted it all, come down, we'll, have a we'll test it. So I go to the director's box with the telephone he goes downstairs to the bench, sits next to the bench, and he said, all you gotta do is pick it up, just press that button. So I pick up the phone, press the button, it rings down in the dugout, and Tony picks up the phone. And I says, oh, it's working perfect then. He says, yeah, it's perfect. I said, fantastic, great job, Tony, thanks very much. Put, puts down the phone. Saturday comes, I'm in, the, I'm in the director's box, I wanna speak to Steve Harrison. So I pick up the phone, press the button to, to dial uh, so it rings down in the dugout and no one's picking up the phone. So I put it down, dial it again. Now sm smoke's now coming out of my ears, I'm going mental. Whatever it is that's going on the pitch, I want it changed or I want something done about it. So I pick up the phone again, press the button, nothing's happened. I can hear it ringing. No one's answering, answering the phone. I'm going absolutely mental. What are the bloody idiots doing? No one's bloody picking up the phone. Unbeknown to me, when we tested it, it was in a completely empty stadium. And it's just like a normal ringtone that's, that's in your house. 
On a Saturday, there's 40,000 people in there who are making a noise. No one can hear it ringing. Nobody at all can hear the phone ringing. So that is the reason why no one was picking it. So anyway, I'm, coats come off, my ties come off and everything. I've run downstairs, I've gone down to, is one of you gonna pick up the bloody phone? Never heard it, boss. And obviously they hadn't heard it because of, they, they just couldn't hear the, uh, the ringtone. So the following week, we had a bell put on it about this big, honestly. When that rang, you could hear it all around Birmingham, you know, when I dialed. So there was no way they were gonna ignore the phone after that, but um, yeah, a little mishap. I couldn't speak to anybody, but um, that's how we communicated. We, we communicated on the phone, and um, I spoke to Steve Harrison most of the time. Mobiles were, we did have mobiles in those days, but sometimes you couldn't quite get a line or something, you know, there was some kind of interference. So we, we used this, and obviously when we played away, we did exactly the same, but then we had to use the mobiles. And uh, we played, we played Leeds United away, this is a little bit later on, on, uh, it was a New Year's Day fixture. So I think we played the 3rd of January or something. But it was on a Monday, it was a Monday afternoon on January the 3rd, which was Bank Holiday Monday in those days. And um, I've got my phone in my pocket, my mobile, and I've been on the phone to Steve Harrison at Leeds. We're winning 2-1 at Leeds, which is a big game between us and Leeds in those days. Both going for the title. And uh, I've, I've now gone down to the bench, I've said something to Steve, and I've, I'm now st stood there next to the bench, and suddenly my phone rings, my mobile phone in my pocket. It's now 25 to five, we're winning 2-1 at Ellen Road. Gareth Southgate scored two goals for that day. Anyway, my phone's ringing, so I've looked at my phone thinking, who's ringing me at, at, 20, at 25 to five on a Monday when I'm sort of with the villa, you know, in this match? And look, it's my son. My son's name's come up. And I thought, oh, something serious has happened. So anyway, I answer my phone and he says, uh, all right, Dad. And I said, what do you want? Said, What's happened? He said, no, nothing. What, what are you up to? I said, what am I up to? I said, I'm at Ellen Road. He said, oh, really? I thought that was tonight. I thought the match was tonight. I said, no. I said, it's, we've got five minutes to go. He said, what's the score? I said, oh, we're winning 2-1. And he said, okay, bye. Put the phone down, that was it. And I was just thinking, what the hell are you doing You're ringing me? But I really thought there was something seriously wrong. But um, yeah, we were winning 2-1 and we obviously went on to win 2-1. But yeah, it was tough. Um, it was tough set upstairs sometimes. But that day at Ellen Road, I can remember, even though I was upstairs, I can remember coming down to the bench, we are winning 2-1. And I can remember going back to my seat upstairs took me five or six minutes. I started looking at the pictures in the director's box. It was pictures of the great Leeds team of the past. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not allowed on the bench. There's nothing I can do. This is murder. This is actually murder trying to watch it from upstairs. We're winning 2-1 at Leeds. And so I started looking at the pictures in the boardroom of all the great Leeds teams of the past. And I'm, I've got, obviously, one ear is listening to the noises outside, so if they're getting excited, I think that's them attacking. When it goes quiet, we must have the ball kind of thing. So, you know, I thought, well, if I go upstairs, I'm just going to sit there swearing and cursing. And so I just sort of started looking at pictures. And, and there was a famous one at Everton, of course, when uh, in the sixth round of the cup, when I've come down from the stand down to the dressing room at half-time, 44 minutes, I've made my way down to the dressing room, and in that time, unbeknown to me, uh, Benny Carboni put us 2-1 up. And I got in the dressing room, and I said to Kevin McDonald, I'm taking Mercer off, and he says, oh, he just did brilliant for the goal, didn't he? I said, what goal? <laughs> he said, the goal just now that Carboni scored. I said, Carboni hasn't scored, it's one all. Steve Stone scored our goal, he said, no, Benny Carbone is just scored. We're winning 2 1. And I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I just thought it was 1 8. So. You still took him off as well? I still took him off. I was right though. I put t I think Tails was sub that day. I put Tails on instead. Most of them had kicked apart from that. Johnny Collins had stood on him all game, followed him everywhere, and really sort of marked, marked Paul out of the game that day. But um, yeah, we were winning 2 1, and it stayed that way, and we went through to the semi final, of course. Think about that cup final every day. Disaster, yeah. 
it, as we're talking about it now. It pains me, it hurts me, it still lives with me and I think about it often. Um, and uh, it was one of the, uh, if not the biggest regret I've ever had. Uh, should have been more bolder as, as a manager, as the coach of the team, yeah. to have um, tried to win it as opposed to not losing it. I went to see Doug and told him that I wanted Muzzy Is It, and he, he said no, and he'd never said no to me. Was, well, we're just on top of the league. And it was like, Doug sometimes, it was like, why, why do you need another player? We're top. <laughs> you know, I said, well, we need another player because I want to stay top. If you enjoyed that video, why not watch another one? Click the video choices on screen now to go and watch them in full. And don't forget to subscribe. Click on our logo there on the left and press subscribe. Easy.